Hello everyone, I am Nathan P. Butler, author of A Saga on Home Video, a fan's guide to U.S. Star Wars home video releases, which you can find on Amazon right now, and this is my Star Wars blog, The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof, and maybe you'll find that in this episode I am the Voice of Reason. Maybe you'll find that it is that lack thereof, and my reason has gone out the window because this is the episode in which you'll be able to get some initial sort of gut reactions from me about The Last Jedi. I've been asked a lot about my thoughts just in basically the last couple of days, um, but it's tending to be people who are asking it before the movie was even out in the United States. Hey, I saw it in Australia. Hey, I saw it in the UK. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. I'm like, chill and let me watch it first. Now that I have, I wanted to make sure to get those thoughts out fairly quickly to you, hence recording at night, so not as good uh, of lighting at this point, no sunlight coming in to help, um, but this is the night of release, so you'll be getting some fairly quick turnaround on these thoughts on the film. Um, keep in mind, if you want to get a spoiler-free sense of what I thought of the film, check out the previous blog. This one will be spoiler-filled. You have been warned. Spoiler-filled, spoiler-filled, spoiler warning. Got it? Great. Um, there's also another vlog right before this for those who are looking for re uh, sort of gut reactions on other things recently in case you want to make sure you don't miss any episodes of the vlog. There was one that was about basically the rumors or the seeming confirmation through Zavi that we'd be getting The Last Jedi in 4K for home video release and the whole thing about Disney in the being in the process of acquiring the uh, TV and movie assets from 20th Century Fox and all of that. So... Three vlogs released fairly quickly back-to-back. -back. This is the last of those three, and this is the spoiler-filled take on The Last Jedi. You'll be able to hear more about my thoughts on this, as I actually have a chance to have a discussion about it in a few different places. And I think the discussion might be where I'm able to sort of process things that right now I really haven't had the chance to process or been challenged on enough to fully process. Uh, so understand that what you're getting here are just some basic reactions. But I will be doing more live streaming of Battlefront 2. When I do that, starting now, spoilers will be welcome for The Last Jedi. I'll have a little spoiler warning in the title and a little bar at the bottom of the screen so people can come into the chat and discuss that with you. We can have a conversation that way uh, if you want to be involved in that. Uh, also, I'll be doing a reaction episode to The Last Jedi uh, where Mark Hurlum and I Mark Herlemai? Herlemai? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Mark, I just changed your, your last name. Don't worry about it. Uh, where Mark Herleman and I will be talking about it on Star Wars Beyond the Films. Uh, that'll probably be released within the next, I would say, week to two weeks to try to get it in here still in December. Uh, we'll also be doing an episode, I'm sure, about The Last Jedi for Cloud City Casino, or at least wrapping it into some of our other discussion, uh, where Michael Morris and I will talk about it. I think Mark and I are going to mostly agree on the film. Michael and I seem to be very opposite on it, which is not unusual at all. Um, but that should make for uh, some interesting conversation in both of those. You can find both Star Wars Beyond the Films and Cloud City Casino at StarWarsReport.com. Again, the episodes are not out yet, but if you hop by there or go on iTunes or whatever and subscribe, even if you don't listen to any older episodes at all, though I certainly hope that you would, um, it should be coming up in the next episode or two, uh, a little bit more discussion, uh, spoiler-filled, about the film. Okay, but gut reactions here initially, um, and I said this back in the spoiler-free one. I'm not going to go into the whole process of you know how we went to see it and the weird people who were talking about Luke and Vader being the same person and stuff in line. You want to hear about our weird experience of that, see the spoiler-free version. Um, but I will say one thing because I think it is sort of the, the cornerstone of the way that I'm looking at the film right now, and that is something that I repeated in that episode, that when I got home, actually not even when I got home, while I was standing there waiting for my wife to finish using the restroom at the theater, um, I posted to Facebook, holy shit, I need time to process this, or something to that effect. And I think I'm still in that place. This was a film that was very different than other Star Wars films, yet connected very well to them at the same time. Uh, it was a different style. It took some directions I did not expect it to take, which is unusual for me to have actual surprises in Star Wars films instead of them feeling like I kind of know generally where they're going, just maybe not every beat of how they're going to get there. Um, it had some great performances in it. Um, it just is a little bit different. Um, it's an unusual tale for Star Wars, um, but I think an important one. 
and I think one that'll probably wind up being one of my favorites, but I'm not sure yet. It may wind up being a favorite. It may wind up somewhere in the middle because I'm still trying to process everything that I saw to get a good feel for it. And I'm the guy who at one point thought of Attack of the Clones as my favorite, then Revenge of the Sith was my favorite, then The Force Awakens, then Rogue One, and in between at least those eras, Return of the Jedi was uh, my favorite for a while. Um, but I am someone who tends to be able to be swayed by the newest, shiniest Star Wars film, it seems, and I'm not able to kind of step back and give a full, fair comparison of one Star Wars film to another uh, with retrospect. Is that a word? I know it's retrospective with retrospect or in retrospect. Um, without a little bit more time passing first. So just take that with a grain of salt. I think it's going to be one of my favorites. certainly has some of my favorite performances in any Star Wars film ever in it. But does that make for a Star Wars film that'll be my favorite or among that favorite tier that right now has The Force Awakens and Rogue One constantly jockeying for first and second? Uh, we're just going to have to see. One thing that's really playing into that uh, still need to process this type of feel for me and how the film was so different is that I would draw distinct parallels between this film and this book. Uh, this, if you're not familiar with it, is from the Legends continuity. This is Star Wars The Black Fleet Crisis, Book 2, Shield of Lies, uh, by Michael P. QB McDowell. I've never figured out if I'm pronouncing the first part of his last name correctly, but uh, Shield of Lies. What was unusual about this book at the time that it came out is that it told a Star Wars story by basically taking characters whose stories are essentially separate for most of the tale and following them on their journeys, knowing that eventually there would be a connection, and there was a connection going into the story, but that for the bulk of this story, it's almost like reading two books at the same time that happen to be within the same covers. And to a lot of, of ways, I feel like this film was like that. You had uh, Ray's story with Luke, which happened to also pull in Chewbacca and R2-D2, and it would eventually wind up connecting with Kylo Ren and uh, the leadership of the First Order and Snoke and so forth. And then you also had the story going of the evacuation and the escape and what was going on with Leia and Poe, which pulled in uh, Holdo and pulled in uh, BB-8 and so forth and had uh, Finn and Rose in it for a while, and then Finn, Rose, and BB-8 get sort of sent off, but it's still a connected storyline to that one. But it's like, whether it was thought of as three storylines or two, one of which just kind of branches because of Rose and uh, Finn and BB-8 going off on their mission, it didn't really feel like this film was one whole story. It was things going on at the same time with these parallel characters. And whereas we've seen that in Star Wars before, in fact, we've seen that in Star Wars a lot, especially in the novels where you have characters that start together, they go off on their own paths, and eventually the paths lead them back together for a final confrontation. Um, it's sort of the classic Star Wars formula. In fact, it was weird to see Star Wars novels sometimes not use that formula, and certainly it's the way that the films wind up often working out. But in this case, instead of it being, here's the situation, now we're separated, now we're back again, it was much more, uh, and now that we're back again, it's going to be a longer time back again, it's almost like this trilogy is designed like that, in that you get the feeling that they're back together again for episode 9 as of the end of the film, and they were together, for the most part, or working more closely together for The Force Awakens. But in this middle section, they've gone off on these separate paths that will eventually converge and do by the end of this film, but only barely. It's a different approach. It's a similar style. But because of when those things take place, that that type of formula is used for a trilogy instead of a single film, makes it a little tricky to deal with. So let's see. I guess sort of... Um, General thoughts or big ideas, and then I'll get into specific characters, maybe. I guess that's that's one way to do this. I don't want this to go overly long, since I know I'll be talking about this more and more in other venues, but I do want to be able to give you these initial thoughts. Um, I do think that the structure of the story, while unusual, worked for the story that it was trying to tell, and it allowed it to experiment with things like flashbacks that we don't generally see much within Star Wars, uh, outside of, say, Rogue One and a little bit within Visions and such in The Force Awakens. It allowed them to do some things with the Force that maybe in a more traditional Star Wars film we wouldn't have really accepted, like the whole idea of Kylo and Rey being able to have that connection over distance that Snoke takes credit for, um, that allows them to have those conversations, even have the sensation of physically touching hands and so forth that gave them the different visions and all. Um, so that was pretty cool. 
Um, I do find that it's cool that we got some answers, but not all. Uh, but I worry that in some cases, the answers we didn't get may not be forthcoming at all. Like, I want to know who the hell Snoke is. Where is Snoke from? What is Snoke? Who is Snoke if we're supposed to know him from somewhere else, but I don't think we are? Um, are we ever going to get background on Snoke? What about the hints given in the visual dictionary that suggest, because of the uh, the look of him and the look of one of the symbols that there is, that maybe he is from maybe an order that predates the Jedi and was like a light and dark side using force order or something? Um, I want to know what's up with that. Maybe Ryan Johnson's new trilogy will give us those answers. Maybe we'll get books to give us the answers, comics to give us the answers. Uh, I would say give us a video game to give us the answers with an actual linear story, but apparently EA says F you if you like uh, single-player game experiences after what happened with a, a Battlefront, even though Battlefront's campaign is, you know, pretty decent. Uh, it's good, just not you know, anything atypical. But... The fact that uh, we don't get those answers worries me because now that Snoke is dead, which was a huge surprise to me, I did not exceed, I didn't see that coming at all. Um, I wonder if we're going to get those answers or if the next film is just going to move forward and we're not going to know anything about where he came from. The fact that we didn't have those answers had me thinking whenever we saw him dead on the ground, like that maybe we're going to see him twitch and it'll turn out that somehow he can survive being bisected um, because that's just what his species can do or something. Um, because surely we're going to be able to get an answer for him. But I guess two miraculous saves in one film were not going to be uh, acceptable, perhaps, to audiences. So uh, we didn't get answers on Snoke, but we did get answers when it came to what happened with Luke's Jedi Temple, why did Kylo destroy it, although we didn't get any answers on what happened to the rest of the students in terms of did any of them like join and become Knights of Ren. Where the hell are the rest of the Knights of Ren? What about the Knights of Ren we see Rey with in that vision? If Kylo turns bad and doesn't have his armor or anything and brings everyone down, does that mean that the vision that Rey had in The Force Awakens of Kylo in the armor with the Knights of Ren is from the future, perhaps? Um, we didn't really get any answers about the Knights of Ren aspect of things, but we got more answers about what happened to cause the destruction of the temple, and... Uh, Luke to sort of give up and Ben to go dark and everything. Uh, that was probably the most controversial point that I've seen people being concerned about with the film is the idea of Luke would never strike down his own student to prevent the next Vader and so forth. He would always try to act with mercy or try to steer them from that path and so forth. Um, and I would argue that for the most part, maybe Legends Luke would, although he sort of treaded the line a few times because he's had to take down some students who turned to the dark side uh, or try to take them down. And in some cases they got redeemed, in some cases not so much. But I think it humanizes Luke uh, along with the fear and all the concerns that he has in this film and just his unwillingness in some cases to be willing to move forward um, without destroying the past, uh, seeing himself as a failure and seeing that failure as an end instead of that failure as a learning experience, as Yoda points out. Uh, Yoda, by the way, in the film, I felt looked a little weird, sounded great, but he, I mean, did he have walnuts in his cheeks or something? I don't know what the deal was with that. He seemed like he was kind of more poofy uh, of a Yoda. Maybe Yoda gained weight uh, after his death somehow, and his ghost has been eating too many bonbons or something, uh, or too many fried porgs, as the case may be. Um, but I think that that really humanized Luke, that he could have that moment of fear and doubt and of all the things he could be afraid of, of all the things that could be gnawing at him as a possibility of trying to train new Jedi, the idea of essentially him training the next Vader is huge and certainly would be something that if anything could terrify the man, that would. That might cause him to have that moment of, of being about to make a bad decision and yet his strength of character drives him away from it. But I find it really kind of profound and very human also then in essence, what happens then is kind of a, a, a matter of misunderstanding. Luke turns on the lightsaber. Luke is going to go after Ben. And Luke's like, no, 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 can't do it. And is about to turn it off as Ben wakes up, sees it, grabs the blade, attacks, and boom, everything goes to hell. They don't get a chance to talk about it. Luke doesn't get a chance to turn it off and say, I'm sorry, I'm concerned about you, let me explain why, or anything like that. They both react on instinct in what they're seeing, 
and both think they're right in that moment. Luke would even say, you know, he was, uh, he never got a chance to explain himself. So in that essence, to some degree, he was in the right. Um, and certainly Kylo wasn't justified in what he did. But Kylo looks at it as him being justified as well because he sees it as he was going to be killed. He doesn't know what was going on inside Luke's head. Um, yeah, very human type of moments, but I think it pushes some people back because it makes you think, whoa, whoa, this isn't the Luke we know. This isn't the mythical archetype hero that we know. But I wonder if we're being prepared for that, for this continuity, in things like the Star Wars ongoing comic right now with things like Ashes of Jedha. Luke has had moments of wanting to go into more violent ways of dealing with the Empire than we really have seen in most of the Legends continuity materials. Now it's kind of a whole new ball game, and we're getting a different side of Luke to give him more, I don't want to say depth, but more dimensions maybe, uh, more sides to his character, more flaws than we're used to seeing with Luke. Um, remember, there was a time when Luke was so almost godlike and and pure in the things that he did, that it, he was even taken to task for it by Mara Jade in sort of a meta-commentary uh, in the Hand of Thrawn duology by Timothy Zahn. I'm also wondering to an extent here whether or not what we learn in terms of answering questions about Rey's parents is true or not. Was Kylo saying what he said about them just being nobodies, was that just to get at her, or was that the truth? If it's the truth, it's profound that, of course, you can see a hero rise from the common people, um, it also would make sense that, as he said, you know, basically your parents sold you off for water or whatever, that would sort of make sense being that it was Jakku, and when we saw the flashback or the force vision of young Rey uh, as the ship was going off, the person holding her and telling her, you know, to quiet was Unkar Plutt, who is just the kind of guy who would say, yeah, I'll take the kid, here's some water, that's fine, that's cool, human trafficking, not a big deal, I'm not even human, so I don't even care all that much. Um, so I'm curious if that was actually the truth, or maybe it's a truth from a certain point of view kind of a thing. Um, and I think the biggest questions that were sort of lingering were, how does this hand it off to the new generation, and how are they going to deal with Carrie Fisher's death? And that, I don't think they really had a way to deal with at all. I'm really kind of curious where the next film goes with Carrie Fisher having passed away, if they're not going to CGI recreate Leia or something, or keep footage that was meant for this one and use it for that or something. Um, because in essence, they have used The Force Awakens to shuffle Han off the board. They've used this film to shuffle Luke off the board. Now they need to shuffle Leia off the board, and they almost did. Um, and that was, by the way, that was a fantastic moment. There's a lot of people like, oh, I don't get it. That is so dumb. It's like she's Mary Poppins or something. How stupid can you get when it comes to the whole Leia thing? Uh, my take on that, and this is kind of reaction, so almost chain of consciousness kind of stuff here. I uh, apologize for a lack of structure. But, wow, I just sounded a lot like my director at work. I, I know he's exactly who would have said, you know, I apologize for the lack of structure. <laughs> giving some thoughts. Um, but... I think that that worked out well. You would figure that she would have got at least a little bit of training from Luke, uh, and that certainly um, she has, to some degree, some um, iner in inherent ability, because she's able to sense certain things. We get little hints of little bits and pieces of what little she knows from Luke in, uh, I believe it was Bloodline. And uh, just the way that that scene played out, I'm watching the trailer, and I'm thinking that if anybody's going to kill her, it's going to be Kylo, and it's going to be in that scene where he's blasting the ship. And, of course, we're meant to be led to believe that, to freak us out when we're watching the trailer. But I found it really good, uh, really entertaining, and fitting with the character, adding to his depth. Then when the time came, after having been berated by Snoke, that Kylo couldn't do it. He couldn't pull the trigger on his own mother. Uh, he couldn't kill the past, so to speak, for himself, the way that he tried to start doing by killing his father. He wouldn't do it. He couldn't do it. And it turns out it's the other First Order assholes with him who fire the shot. And then, boom, and she's just out in space. And I thought that was it. I figured that's how they remove Carrie Fisher and her role as, as General Leia because she has passed away. And, wow, they didn't really use her a whole lot in this film. She may have even gotten more screen time in The Force Awakens. Then she awakens 
out in space. They're just like, I can't do that. We've seen it in Star Wars before. Chill the hell out. Uh, but then you have the so-called Mary Poppins moment. And I think what people are having an issue with a lot of the time uh, when I'm seeing this described is they're having trouble understanding what happened. They're thinking she just put her hand out and flies like Superman to go to the ship. No. Last I heard, flying like Superman was not a Jedi ability. Jumps, maybe, but flying like Superman, levitation, eh, it's getting kind of borderline there. The way I'm interpreting that, and I guess it'll take probably the novelization months from now uh, to be able to say for sure, is that what she was doing was a force grab, like pulling something to you with the force. But you're in zero gravity. You have the whole issue of mass, momentum, inertia, and all of that, and uh, the equal and opposite reactions that if she, a very small person, is compared to a very large ship, and she exerts a pull against that ship, instead of it moving towards her, she will move towards it. And essentially what she's doing is she's using the force to essentially pull the ship, and in doing so, it is instead pulling her back into the ship. For me, that is one of the few instances of using the Force and physics at the same time in a way that, to me, actually made sense in Star Wars. And instead, people are like, Oh my God, she's Kara zor -El. Just stop. Stop. Think the scene through, please. But, as I was saying, on the, on the broader point, I think they sort of left themselves a problem now of what do they do for the next film. Um, I actually thought if anybody was going to be shuffled off the board this time, it was going to be Leia, and Luke would be left to appear in the next film. Um, all right, so other reactions of Porgs. Porgs, funny, cute. I have no problem with Porgs right now. I much prefer Porgs to Gungans or Ewoks at this point. Um, they are cute. They are funny. I do not regret my wife now having some Porgs that I have bought for her of different types. Um, like I thought I was going to. Turns out Porgs are all right uh, and apparently tasty, although... I wonder if Chewbacca actually wound up eating that one. Uh, the island, Ach 2, I want to know more about how the Force is so powerful there. I want to know a little bit more about the dark side aspect there. Um, kind of want to know why Ray is an idiot and decided, gee, I need answers. I'm going to go to the super dark side part that I was warned against and whee! And splash down into it. Um, I, I get that she wanted answers, but damn. And I know there are going to be people saying, wait a second, how could Ray possibly know how to swim? Well, maybe she learned how to swim before uh, she went to Jakku. Maybe there actually was a chance, though I doubt it, to learn how to swim on Jakku. Um, maybe she was just like, oh my god, water! And she dog paddled herself to the shore. Are we going to get wrapped up in that? Remember that in the Legends continuity, there was a whole thing of Luke being able to swim and Leia not, and then Leia being able to swim and Luke not, depending on which source you looked at back in the late 70s, early 80s. It's okay. It's not like she was going to drown. She's a main character. It's very much like the Family Guy thing. We have several main characters on the ship at this point. I think we're going to be fine. She was going to make it to shore. It's okay. I was surprised at how little Canto Bite actually wound up being used in the film, given how much it was hyped up ahead of time. Uh, I do think it was a cool new setting and a new twist on the idea of, hey, it's the cantina scene for this movie, um, but still a little bit odd. I also found it kind of striking and unusual how small the resistance is relative to, say, the old rebellion. And the fact that they're starting to use the rebel terminology again at this point. Because, wow, it's tiny. You can get that little bit of rebels onto the ships so that you can have this chase of basically them being about ready to wipe out the entire resistance all at once. And I know the idea is that there were other helpers out there in the galaxy, but we don't actually see them. Uh, in fact... There's a part of me that had to go, damn, when they said, oh, yeah, yeah, we've we've managed to get our signal out to all these other groups that support us, but none of them are coming. I figured what that meant was they're coming, but they're coming later or something. Um, we'll see them show up triumphantly at the end of the film to save the day like the Mandalorians in Rebels or something. And instead, it was much more of a, a yeah, yeah, they support us, but, but yeah, you're screwed and they're not going to go down with you. So, ah, well. I thought the whole force communication thing was pretty cool, but again, kind of unusual. Um, I didn't expect that Ray and Kylo would wind up having that type of personal connection. Uh, not, I don't mean through the force, I mean just as characters. I thought that they would wind up being sort of the opposite ends, sort of the Luke and Vader type characters who would always be at odds 
And while there would be maybe some temptation at some point, there would never really be a point where you could see them truly as being on the same side or that one of them could realistically go to the other one's side, at least during the point of conflict itself. And uh, instead, we got the exact opposite. We got them actually becoming so close that I could have been led to believe that, yeah, Kylo was going to redeem himself. But instead, his dickishness came back at just the right moment to ruin any chance of that, at least in this film. And I'm sure there's more plot point stuff all kind of rattling around in here. Um, but let's move on to characters because I don't want to go over long, as I've said here. So um, let's see. Uh, Luke used very well. I'm not sure about all those who were saying that uh, Mark Hamill deserves an Oscar nod for this, but it was a hell of a performance, the best performance we've seen uh, as Luke, the most range seen as Luke. I actually really, really enjoyed the ending where Luke has his battle with Kylo because I initially thought something weird was going on, and I was thinking, how in the hell did they not catch this? Surely they caught this as I'm staring at the screen, and the lightsaber that just got broken in half is being used by Luke. And I'm like, what the hell? Why isn't he using his green one? Surely somebody would have caught this. There must be a reason. And sure enough, it was a giveaway to sort of get the audience knowing ahead of time, hey, psst, this can't be real. Right? It's got to be a vision or a projection of some kind. Although, you have to wonder, you know, does this mean that Kylo thinks that Luke built an identical saber to the one that he used to have? Why wouldn't Kylo have been saying, wait a second, where's your green one? Uh, but a cool moment got us to see Luke in a different look than what he had throughout the entire rest of the film. And the idea that he would spend his last energy not on going out in a blaze of glory, not in some big fight like I think a lot of us expected, but that in essence, he would simulate the fight because he was buying time for others to escape, serving life as his last act, getting to the point where he's used up his reserves and exhausted himself to the point where he would finally fade and join the Force. Which was another big question. Would he be able to do what Obi-Wan and Yoda had been able to do? Would they have been able to teach him while he was on the island or sometime since Return of the Jedi? Thankfully, the answer was yes. He gets to fade away. We get the cool breeze blowing away the robe and... Luke exits the picture. So the way they handled Luke, very well. Uh, Leia handled pretty well, although I would agree with Michael Morris on the idea that it's kind of a, a tough thing to imagine her leaving Holdo to be the one to control uh, the Radis instead of sending Holdo away and Leia being one to go down with the ship. Um, that struck me as a little bit odd. Otherwise, I think it works fairly well. I think her using the Force there kind of to save herself, the instinct, whatever, I think that worked fine. I think it's getting kind of old at this point, especially with the Poe Dameron comics, of the number of times Leia has to tell Poe, stop being a hotshot asshole and do your damn job. Uh, be a leader. But thankfully, he seems to get it here. Um, so I think she worked well. I think she worked better in this film than she did in the last film, in The Force Awakens. Um, but I am curious what they do now, of course, for her. Uh, Chewbacca? Almost nothing to do. R2-D2? Almost nothing to do. C-3PO? Almost nothing to do. Uh, BB-8? Some cool moments, some kind of funny moments. Uh, we finally got to see the whole head separating and coming back thing, which we know from the toys and such, but and the guides, but we hadn't actually seen, I don't think, uh, on screen. We sort of got a way of figuring out how it is that he can like have his head suctioned and pulled into the top of the X-Wing and then somehow pop out the top and his head is now on top and there's no thing grabbing it or nothing. Like, how does he turn around while he's inside the X-Wing? Uh, little stuff like that. Um, he got a chance to really be a hero. Uh, I really thought when the, the walkers started blasting against the First Order to save Rose and Finn, that surely it was going to be DJ having a change of heart in his hung solo -y sort of way. And instead, DJ, new character, highly hyped, basically a jackass, basically a jerk basically someone you want to punch. Um, turns out he didn't have a change of heart. It was BB-8 coming to the rescue, and that definitely surprised me. Uh, DJ just remained a jerk, basically. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I guess sticking with the light side characters. Uh, Ray, love the growth for Ray. I think she's finally coming into her own. Um, it's good to see uh, sort of a reason for why she became as strong as she did so quickly, and the idea is sort of this, that there's a light balance rising to her uh, to counter Kylo, and why it was that Snoke was so intent on taking out Luke, 
not just to stop the rise of a new Jedi Order, but because he thought it'd be Luke's power rising, as Kylo's did, but instead it was Rey. Thought that was pretty cool. Um, the fact that she's willing to confront Luke, and she sort of has yet another of these surrogate father figures who, in this case, is sort of disappointing her, and she has to find a way to sort of earn his trust and so forth, works well. Uh, be interesting to see where she goes from here, of course. Finn... Good to see Finn sort of taking responsibility, sort of being a hero to some degree. Um, the fact that this time when he was running away, it wasn't to save himself like it was in The Force Awakens. This was him running away to try to save Rey, to keep her from rejoining the fleet and getting killed. Um, but Rose, cool new character. Um, quick, easy motivation. Kill off the sister. Right? Kill off the sister in a dramatic moment. Now you've got some motivation for her. Um, but I think that worked fairly well. It'll be cool to see where she goes from here. Um, I could see how she could fall for Finn quickly. That's another thing people are like, oh my god, she said she loves Finn or something. Ugh, that is so stupid. It's so quick. Well, think about what they'd gone through, both before and after they met, and all the crazy shit that was going down, the adrenaline pumping. The fact that she said, I love you, instead of just humping him right there in the crashed ship, is pretty much an, an exercise of Disney control, right? Um, because... It's, it's intense situations that tend to drive people towards each other. I think that in that case, that is what happened, although I'm not sure Finn noticed it really at the time. Uh, so much for all those Finn Poe shippers out there, right? Um, speaking of Poe, uh, Poe actually gets to sort of think like a leader here. He sort of pulls his head out of his ass, which is good after what he's trying to do falls apart, and it turns out that, in essence, he was trying to stop something that really was going to help them but he just didn't have all the information um, that he needed, that he was not entitled to, uh, which worked well. The fact that Maz played so small a role was kind of surprising to me, but at least Maz appeared in the film, though I don't know that she appeared enough in the film to warrant having uh, the actress's name in the main credits before the Leia dedication, the Carrie Fisher dedication at the end of the film, but whatever. Again, kind of on the hero side, you've got DJ. Uh, I believe that stands for Douche Jackass. Um, he was kind of an odd character uh, with a verbal tick and everything that he had, but you never quite knew what was going to happen with him. It'll be interesting if we see him again. I hope we do because he's one of those characters that needs more depth to really get a good feel for him because we didn't really get it so much here. But uh, I'd, I'd be open to seeing DJ show up again uh, and not on... Episodes of Fuller House. Um, and, and may I say, may I say that uh, that's for uh, now that DJ has shown up in Star Wars, um, Candace Cameron uh, has really let herself go uh, to look the way that she did in The Last Jedi. Oh! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Del Toro, gotcha. No problem. Um, jumping to the dark side, or jumping to the uh, First Order, Captain Phasma's back! Just in time to get her ass kicked and die. Congratulations, Captain Phasma. You have joined the Boba Fett school of you look cool and don't do a whole hell of a lot. Um, I was hoping that something from the Phasma novel would give us a sense of more about her so we cared more about what happened to her in this film and maybe her background would tie into it somehow. No, not one single flippin' bit. She shows up, she fights, she croaks. The end. And what is it with these films and the idea that if you're going to die, we're not going to show the death. We just want to knock you down and make you fall into something that you're not going to be able to survive falling from. Okay, we get it. Heights suck. Maybe find some other ways to kill people. Maybe, like, freeze somebody and hasta la vista baby them or something. Um, but, yeah, I thought Phasma was really poorly and underused for all the hype back in Force Awakens. She's better here, but... She basically is just there to, to provide a, a quick point in the evolution uh, of the Finn character to show how far he's come, pretty much. Um, Hux. Hux is a stressed out dude. I feel sorry for Hux, you know? Um, Hux looks like what you would get if you had a Weasley who was trying to use magic and hadn't been able to actually pull off using magic for, like, a year, so he's all pent up and frustrated, more or less. He's like... Ron's pent-up, frustrated older brother. Um, that said, the interact interaction between him and Kylo, um, pretty interesting. 
more of that rivalry we saw before, except now there's not going to be someone who is able to hold them in check, so now Kylo can just beat the shit out of him, basically, whenever he's tired of him. Um, so, kind of cool to see that dynamic, although he's, I don't know, he's, it's, it's weird. His character has always just come off as having a weird feel to me for some reason. Um, Kylo Ren, absolute standout thing of the film for me. Um, I love the complex psychology of Kylo Ren, and this had it in spades. Seeing why he's doing things, um, questioning himself, uh, being willing to turn against Snoke, but not against the ideals that he was believing in and having been taught by Snoke and so forth. Um, I think his emotional journey here that essentially takes him and sort of wavers him and then finally solidifies him, but on the wrong side, uh, was awesome, was fantastic. Um, so Kylo Ren did very well in this, and I think that this hopefully will quell some of the issues from Force Awakens critics, because one of the things the Force Awakens critics said a lot of times was, well, he's just this wishy-washy, stupid, bad, low-rent Vader-type character. Why does he have to be so emotional? Why does he have to be so emo? Well, it's because of the way the emotional payoff needs to go for a character arc of a character like that that is more complex than just, I'm evil because I'm evil, or I'm evil because I made a bad choice back at the end of the Clone Wars, and now I'm just kind of still evil because I don't really want to choose anything else until my kid's in danger, like Vader. Um, I mean, this is a more complex character, and just like you needed Jar Jar to be a bumbling idiot so that it would make sense he'd be the good-natured fool who would fall for the ruse and give Palpatine the emergency powers or push for it, you needed to have emo Kylo in Force Awakens to have emotionally distraught Kylo in... The Last Jedi. So that worked out great, in my opinion. And then you got uh, Snoke and his Praetorian Guard. Praetorian Guard, kind of cool to see in a fight. Interesting to see in a fight. Interesting the way they fight. I don't think we ever heard any of them speak or anything. So it makes for a cool fight sequence, and they look kind of neat. Although his throne room made them look a little bit weird. I mean, was that basically a room with, like, red screens up or something behind him or something? It's like... Um, it's like instead of having a green screen room, it was a red screen room, and they forgot to put the background in or something. Just an odd-looking throne room. Snoke himself, very menacing. Uh, I kind of wonder why we didn't see any of that force use through the hologram type thing back in the first film uh, of this trilogy. But now we've got him going totally ape shit and, like, dragging people around and stuff and all kinds of stuff through the force just from uh, being present as a hologram and so forth and all that. Um cool design, you know, he kind of looked like, you know, what if the Snoke we know, you know, hooked up and exchanged uh, outfits with uh, a gold member, which is kind of interesting. And the way that he just kind of played around with Rey like she was nothing was pretty extreme. Um, and I know there are those who are like, well, wait a second, he just said he saw into, into Kylo's mind. How does he not know Kylo's about to kill him? If you listen to what he's saying about, you know, turning the blade, about to put it into his real enemy. It's like he's getting the thoughts or the basic sort of surface thoughts coming from Kylo, but because what Kylo is doing in relation to Rey is the same, in essence, as what he's doing in relation to Snoke, it's masking it so he can actually pull off what he does in activating the saber. Um, but there's a great moment for Kylo. Sucks to be Snoke! And it seems like Snoke is gone before we really got any answers. A very hyped up, ooh, who's this mysterious supervillain in the background? Ooh, look at all his phenomenal cosmic powers! I wonder what they're... Oh, shit, he's dead. Okay, I guess I won't wonder about that stuff anymore. Let's move on to the next plot point. Of course, there was also the new droid, right? Uh, what was it? BB-9E or whatever it is, the one everybody's calling BB-Hate. Very hyped up droid that barely shows up in the film. So, you know, kudos for hyping something we barely see again. Uh, speaking of hype for characters we barely see and such, um, I found the, the moment of sacrifice for Paige, Tycho, or Tico to be a very profound moment. I really like that part of the film. I think it served the film well. Um, I don't think we needed to really get to know Paige in order to feel the impact of her death on Rose so that Rose could then have her motivation. But I am glad to see that thanks to Bomber Command and Cobalt Squadron, we are now going to get some background a little bit more on the Tico sisters. Uh, Paige, who dies, of course, in particular. So I think that uh, worked out fairly well. And I guess while we're sort of circling back uh, briefly to the heroes, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Admiral Emmeline Holdo. Um, she was kind of dull in this film. I mean, she was kind of like 
Leia almost cloned to some degree. Didn't really feel like she had a whole lot of character to herself. Um, really, it's one of those instances of, if you're going to like the character, it seems like you really need to like her from her previous appearances in uh, the new canon books. And in that case, she really doesn't seem to be a lot like the character as we met her in the books. Here, she's just reserved. She's willing to take command, but she's not very bombastic or anything. And she's going to do what's right, even to the point of self-sacrifice. Great! Again, very Leia-ish to some degree. Whereas, if you read Leia, Princess of Alderaan, the book, um, Amalyn is kind of batshit insane. I mean, she's a loon. Uh, she is the... Uh, what is the character's name? Luna Lovegood? Is that the name of the character in uh, the Harry Potter books? Um, she's kind of the <laughs> character to be introduced into the saga as a friend of Leia. And we barely get a sense that they've been friends for a long time, and we get no sense of her being a whack job, which is kind of disappointing. I kind of hope that we would see at least some spark of that character. Otherwise, why make her that odd in her characterization in the materials released leading up to the film? So again, lots and lots of thoughts. Like I said, I'm still kind of processing this. I think it's going to be one of my favorites. But there's a lot to really kind of think about here, and I think I really need to see it again uh, for the first... No, see it again for the second time um, to really get a feel for how this is going to fit in my mental schema, as it's called, uh, of what Star Wars is, can be, should be, uh, and the impact of its different parts on the whole. Um, but I liked it. I thought it was pretty cool. I will go see it again. Can't wait to have it on home video, uh, especially if it comes out in 4K and 3D in the U.S., as it seems to be doing in the U.K., but definitely one that bears further thought, consideration, discussion, and uh, basically just a bit of reflection, quite frankly. So, again, you'll be able to hear me talk about the film with Michael Morris on Cloud City Casino, with Mark Herleman on Star Wars Beyond the Films, and with you all if you drop by in the chat for one of the Battlefront 2 live streams. Um, but I'll go ahead and cut it right now in a lot of sort of rapid-fire initial reaction thoughts. Uh, certainly there's more to come uh, on analysis of this for me, but I didn't want you to have to wait since so many people were asking what were my thoughts on the film. Uh, I give it a thumbs up. How high up? Eh, that's still to be determined, but definitely a film you should check out, definitely one I'm eager to see again, which is definitely a positive, but also something I've said probably about every other Star Wars film I've ever seen, so take it with a grain of salt. With that, I'll wrap up this episode. Thank you for watching, and may the Force be with you.